Released by Monolith Soft in 2006 on the PlayStation 2, Xenosaga Episode 3 would be the finale of a three-episode saga. Director Ko Arai and writer Norihiko Yonasaka return, as the original story intended by series creator Tetsuya Takahashi would have to be cut down from six chapters overall to just three. For story, the game features the return of Shion, Cosmos, and the rest of the cast of Episode 2, as events pick up directly where the last story left off, as a new hunt begins for the duo. There are 10 playable characters, though only 3 can be fielded at a time, including Miyuki and Alan playable for the first time. For battle, the game utilizes a simplified turn-based combat format as before, though with newer options. Boost now acts as a meter to fuel special attacks, and skills can be learned either automatically by leveling up, or acquired by using skill points gained in a battle. Each character has two skill lines that are effectively class-themed skill trees for more focused development. A break gauge replaces break zones, and traps are now manual field items that begin encounters with an advantage. Shops and monetary economy returns, and there is a new platforming minigame called Hack Ox. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. When the game begins, we see a young Kevin Winnicott remembering the destruction of his homeworld of Mictum when the Gnosis first attacked. While his mother would lead him to an escape pod, he would escape, though was forced to watch his mother transform into a horrible Gnosis herself before shooting off into space. As we move to present day, Kevin is alongside the other Testament, uncovering a mysterious tomb. We jump ahead to now see Shion, alongside fellow Vector Industries employee Miyuki, Pilot Kanan, and Agent Doctus, raid Vector's S-Line division in order to steal top-secret data. Shion has quit Vector Industries, and now seeks to expose the company's crimes, and figure out what they intend to accomplish with the UMN. She firmly believes Vector did not establish the UMN network for lightspeed travel and communication, even though it's being used as if they invented it themselves. Backing up the data, they feel they are being observed, as Gnosis now invade the facility, forcing them to make a narrow escape. Afterwards, Shion reminds Miyuki that new information suggests that the Gnosis threat may not have been called by either Dr. Mizrahi or even the Immigrant Fleet, but instead Vector Industries. If that's true, then she also wonders if there was an ulterior motive for Cosmos's construction, whom she still cannot forget about. She receives word from Alan, who is still with Vector, that the company decided to cancel First Division's development of the Cosmos project and transfer it to the military where they will make a new model. Alan himself will be transferred to the military and Fifth Jerusalem, where the project will continue, and he invites her there. She reflects on how six months ago she resigned from Vector after an incident of targeted Gnosis attacks caused Cosmos to be sealed and placed under observation, and she felt she had to take responsibility for it. Feeling so much was unfinished, she now wants to see Cosmos again, and so prepares to go to Fifth Jerusalem. At the same time, Wilhelm states he is aware of the data breach done by Shion, and the Red Testament announces everything is ready for the Zohar project demonstration. Yuli and Helmer now speak, as Helmer reveals the Mictum system has fallen under Orma's control. He also hears that the tactical warship Merkaba has been completed, and like the proto-Merkaba, it has actually existed since ancient times, though Dimitri has now turned it into a weapon. As it turns out, when Albedo got the Y data from Momo, Dimitri somehow obtained it as well. Kanan now comes in, with some of the information they receive from Vector. They discover a landmass called Renla Chateau that once belonged to Lost Jerusalem. It turns out a large number of Gnosis exist around there, and Ormus is interested in it as well, though they do not know what the connection may be. He suggests making an expedition there to learn more, and Yuli says she's made a request of the Kukai Foundation for that already. He also shares that Shion is doing well, though he is uncertain about her new associates, Skientia, a tech-savvy group of outlaws, though Yuli is not above working with them to find the truth behind Vector and the recent Gnosis terrorism. At this time, Junior, Chaos, Jin, and Momo are already approaching Renla Chateau in the Elsa, getting closer in their own ES mechs, and noting the landmass looks like it was cut away from something larger. Ormus forces detect and intercept them, and Margulis is among them in his own custom black ES. Jin clashes blades with him once more, but their duel is interrupted as a space-time anomaly forms around the landmass. As they all hurry to escape the field, Margulis strikes the Elsa, causing it to fall into the landmass. He realizes his error and moves to correct it, but is called back as he receives new orders for the next step of their plan, daring Jin and the others to rescue their friends. Back with Xion, she recalls how it's been one year since the battle in Old Milchen Space, ending with the Zohar being swallowed by a giant Gnosis. Since then, the Gnosis phenomenon has been occurring with increased frequency. In addition, Xion wanted to learn more about the relationship between the Zohar and Milchen conflict on her own, and since about six months ago, has been working alongside the Skientia group. She mentions Lemageton, a control program for the Zohar, developed in Lost Jerusalem era by Grimoire, a mental entity wandering the UMN in search of Nephilim. As it turns out, Vector's own special technology advancement division has been controlling Grimoire from the shadows alongside the government. 
Since Vector also had contact with the Utic organization, and Utic was connected to Ormus, a lot of details have been expertly covered up, except for the person in charge at the time, Suo Uzuki, Xion's late father. After learning this and partly expecting it somehow, Xion quit Vector, though she now makes her way to Fifth Jerusalem. As she lands, Alan is there to greet her, his feelings for her still unchanged, though before they can spend time catching up, Miyuki contacts them to let them know Cosmos has been selected to participate in a weapons demonstration tomorrow against the new model. Soon after, Chaos contacts Xion as a Durandal also pulls into Fifth Jerusalem to inform her the Elsa has fallen into an imaginary pocket after an unexpected shift. He also notes Xion looks rather pale as she suddenly passes out and is contacted by a mysterious Udu wave. She recovers in time for the demonstration, where Alan also informs her control of the Zohar project has been transferred from the contact subcommittee to the military and is now headed by Dmitry Yuryev, Jr.'s father. He notes it's awfully suspicious that he's also the one developing the next generation unit in this demonstration, and it was the government that chose to cancel the Cosmos project. As the new unit is revealed in the demonstration area, Xion is shocked to see how much it looks like Cosmos, though this new unit is called Telos, and is half of the new anti-gnosis weapon system built to replace Cosmos. As hordes of live Gnosis obtained from Vector are unleashed on Telos, she easily ignores their attacks and swiftly destroys them with ruthless efficiency. Curiously, it's not disclosed who designed Telos, but Alan points out the man who is in charge of the project, Roth Mantel. Cosmos is then led into the arena with an updated design, and is facing off against a newly built Omega weapon, which is the other half of Telos' system, and it's also unknown how designs were obtained to even build it. As the two weapons fight, Cosmos puts up a good fight to the sturdy Omega, though few of her attacks are barely effective against the new model. Still, a solid strike knocks Omega back, suddenly causing the weapon to suddenly go berserk and fire everywhere, knocking Cosmos out and endangering the crowd, forcing the demonstration to end. As they leave, they run into Yuli and she speaks briefly with them. As they talk, a small boy comes in named Abel, and Yuli explains her job is now to maintain smooth communication with him as he is an invaluable member of the Zohar project. As the boy draws something, Shion is shocked to see it's a perfect likeness of Nephilim, and wonder how Abel knows her. Afterwards, Roth visits the Cosmos Repair Facility to personally gloat about his win, and also inform them all of the Cosmos Project is shut down immediately, resources will be moved to the Telos Project, and Cosmos herself will be scrapped. Meanwhile, Shion was secretly recording data on Telos from the demonstration, and sends what she can to Skientia to learn more. Doctus shares they learned something new from the data they stole from Vector, and it's a program used for observation and investigation called Kanan, though it's not the same as their Reallian friend. What more, Vector has been using the Kanan program to search for something for over 100 years, so Doctus is going to look into it more and see if there is a connection to the Reallian of the same name. Xion turns to see Nephilim there, warning her that trying to protect someone does not always lead to happiness. She then mentions that Grimoire was trying to find her despite causing so many to suffer, and with him gone the Gnosis should have stopped expanding, but didn't. She plainly states the Gnosis phenomenon happening now is not caused by Lemageton, but instead by an individual who is trying to seek atonement, who is trying to bring happiness to the one important to him at the cost of the suffering of everyone else. She then says the only one who knows where they are headed is Cosmos, and only Xion can open Cosmos' heart before disappearing again. Nephilim then speaks with Chaos outside, saying she hesitated to tell Xion the whole truth, and Chaos replies that while he understands, Xion must learn the truth, even if it won't lead to happiness. At the same time, both Dimitri and Yuli find there is suspiciously no real information on Roth's background, and yet he was still placed at the head of Telos' project, likely as a means to cut Vector out of the picture. With Yuli, Kanan also reports that in order to cut into the hypersphere that Elsa is trapped under, they will need something on the level of Omega's phase transfer cannon. Since Dimitri would never let them use it, that leaves them with Cosmos' tertiary weapon system, as Kanan proposes they use her to rescue the Elsa despite her disposal orders. Elsewhere, Margulis is shocked that his leader Heinlein is ordering them to leave Omega alone, as he claims it has returned to its original master. Back with Xion, Doctor shares that it's highly likely that Ormus may be related to Telos' development. Also, research into her father has been completed, and it looks like he was the government official overlooking Utic at the time the Gnosis broke out. She gets a call from Alan now, right as she passes out again, and this time Alan hurries over to make sure she's alright. She claims it's just exhaustion, and Alan passes along Yuli wants to meet with her on the Durandal. This clashes with a dinner date Alan set up with her earlier, and so Xion asks they go out for a bit together right now. They spend a nice night together, but Xion finds memories of Kevin still surface even now. Going to the Durandal, she meets with Junior, Momo, Ziggy, and Jin again, as Alan informs her of the decision made to scrap Cosmos, and Yuli shows her the hypersphere that has trapped the Elsa. Since Cosmos' own tertiary weapon system is what they need, she proposes they steal Cosmos and rescue the Elsa. Xion agrees, wanting to save everyone, but she once again collapses, worrying the others. 
They commence the operation immediately, moving to break into the Vector research wing, but are somehow led away by an outside force to the hangar holding Omega. Xion feels lightheaded again, and they also see Abel there too, as Alan explains Abel is also Omega's pilot. He points them in one direction, and cautiously the group chooses to believe him, finding themselves in a trash area where Cosmos has been tossed aside. Booting her up, they take note of an odd program running on her, but otherwise she seems to be fine. On their way out, Xion again collapses and is contacted by the Udu Energy, which identifies itself as the will of the universe and questions Xion's desires of the world. Hurrying back to Durandal, they quickly leave Fifth Jerusalem, though Roth and the Blue Testament observe from a distance, noting how everything is proceeding along the destined flow. Returning to the hypersphere, they find the area swarming with Gnosis now, as Cosmos arms herself and fires her phase transfer cannon at maximum power. Her armaments break off due to the stress, but she still succeeds in punching a hole in the hypersphere long enough for the group to slip through. They quickly spot the Elsa and find everyone on board is okay, but the ship won't move due to some strange effect from the landmass, and so the group heads out to investigate. Exploring and finding ancient scripture in a cave, they are attacked by the Blue Testament, who reveals himself to Xion as Lieutenant Virgil, who was gunned down by Cosmos during the evacuation of the Woglinde. As he fires at them from his own black ES, strange energy surrounds the group's ESs that resonates with the words on the walls, and Virgil mocks them for not knowing about the vessels of Anima that they're using. They fight, though they are mostly ineffective against Virgil, as the White Testament now interrupts them, and Junior immediately recognizes him to be Albedo. They reveal the vessels of Anima within Virgil's ES before pulling out, and before long, the team's own ESs fail due to the strange phenomenon Virgil warned them about. Forced to advance on foot, they solve their way past the tomb and emerge outside in a place Xion recognizes from a dream she had. Exploring another tomb, they find graves with the same names as all of their own ESs and the spot from Cosmos' subconscious domain. However, Cosmos herself has never been here before, and as they wander in further, Telus makes a sneak attack on the group that Cosmos shields them from. She states she is here for the 13th key, as the time of awakening has arrived, and proceeds to attack the group, intent on destroying Cosmos. They battle, but Cosmos recognizes that Telus is simply stronger than her, and so she'll do her best to stall her while the rest of the group escapes. Unfortunately, Telus delivers a complete beatdown of Cosmos, and Roth now enters, stating they already know all of her attack patterns, so it's useless, which Xion thinks must have been the mysterious task running on Cosmos when they found her. What more, Roth reveals he is actually the Red Testament, and it's Cosmos' fate to be destroyed by Telos in this place. Telos reveals her own phase transfer cannon and prepares to fire it at Cosmos when a light in Xion's necklace suddenly shines. When Telos delivers the final blow to Cosmos, Xion cries out, her necklace lights up, and blue energy now surrounds Cosmos and resonates with the tomb nearby. The blue light grows to the point where it's visible beyond the hypersphere, and suddenly a memory comes back to Xion of her time with Kevin. Kevin revealed he was the only survivor of the Gnosis attack on Mictum, and gifted Xion with a pendant from his mother, before asking her to stay with him and she agreed. Udu then speaks to Xion again, commenting on her joy of reliving that memory, before Xion now wakes up in a forest separate from everyone. She soon meets everyone again, though they report they can't find Cosmos or the crew of the Elsa, figuring the light from earlier was a warp transfer. As they wander, they are shocked to somehow find Labyrinthos here, and Junior figures they must somehow be on Milsha at least 15 years in the past. Hearing some gunshots, they find a wounded young Lieutenant Virgil and give him first aid. Carrying him, they soon find Fabronia, and Xion knows her church should be nearby. Taking Virgil there, Xion is surprised to indeed also find a young version of herself and Kevin here as well, and they treat Virgil quickly despite Virgil being a Federation soldier and they are of Utic. Seeing the damage to his organs is fatal, Fabronia offers to be a donor for what he needs, but Jin points out there has never been a case of an organ transplant of reality into human, but Fabronia is one of the new transgenic types, meaning her body composition is basically identical to that of a human's. She herself can be frozen and moved to Labyrinthus for regeneration, so she'll be fine, and so they proceed to operate. Things seem to go well, and young Xion points out a ship she spotted that sounds like the Elsa, and so they move to investigate. They find they must pass through a mine there, but an old man warns them the mine is overrun by Utic forces, though his granddaughter Mai fights alongside an autotech called Leopold, his fallen son Tethla used to pilot, as Mai believes Tethla's soul somehow lives on inside the machine. He introduces himself as Aizen Magus, and asks them since they are going in any way to ask Mai to stop fighting. Unfortunately, when they find the rash tomboy, she attacks them, thinking they are from Utic, alongside her father's mech, Leopold. They beat her and the confusion is cleared up, as the Elsa is just beyond, and within, the crew and Alan are fine. However, Cosmos' black box has been broken by Telos, and without her core, she is essentially a vegetable. 
Meanwhile, Yuli contacts the Durandal still waiting outside the hypersphere, warning them the Federation is preparing to invade planet Mictum and planning to use the now complete Merkaba. Dimitri is the one coordinating all of this, but his objective is not just to wipe out Ormus, but likely to also obtain an object there according to the Y data, the Eternal Circle, Zarathustra. She also points out they have the ESs and the emulators, so they may be able to stop Dimitri after rescuing the Elsa. Back with Shion, the group now learns the vessels of Anima are suddenly gone, leaving the frames intact with their power cores somehow missing. With all this bad news and believing this truly is Milsha from 15 years ago, she wishes to go into the city despite the fighting between the Federation and Utik still going on. Alan volunteers to escort her, and along the way, they find an attack Utik transport, and Shion is shocked to see her father there on site to recover what data he can on some new realians that were destroyed. Thinking to steal an ID and uniform from the transport, Shion follows her father to Labyrinthos to learn what his connection to Utik was. As they enter Labyrinthos, Alan notes this is nothing like the hospital they entered in Cosmos' Encephalon before, and Shion admits when she was a child she thought it was a hospital, but now sees this is a high security holding ward for test subjects. While investigating, they actually run into Joachim Mizrahi, and undercover they help him review a list of test subjects capable of linking with Vessels of Anima. He intends to perform a Zohar connection experiment on them, as the Vessels of Anima actually serve as a mediator to approach the Zohar. Their power is a byproduct of acting as a mediator, and why they are used as power reactors for ESs. Alan notes Xion's mother is one of the test subjects, and Xion is then tasked to retrieve Kevin for an update on Fabronia. Xion is surprised to learn Kevin worked with Utik, as he didn't talk about what he did before joining Vector. In Kevin's office, they spot his early work on Cosmos' basic theory, and Xion quickly makes a copy so they can reboot Cosmos. As she is then tasked to deliver data to another ward, she encounters her father Suo, as he is indeed currently using her mother as a test subject. A young Xion enters the ward, and the older Xion is asked to bring her home, The young Xion wants to go visit the church in Virgil first. As she does so, she is surprised to find the young Kevin is so rude and condescending, much different from how she remembers him. At the church, Virgil is recovering but isn't grateful to have a reality and save him with its organs. Fabronia sincerely wishes the best for Virgil despite that, and prays with Shion that there will be a brighter future for her sisters Cecily and Kath as they undergo painful experiments. At the same time, Past Margulis agrees with a plan to have the Realians lose control, and per the suggestion of Kevin, frame Joachim Mizrahi for the incident. Meanwhile, Virgil is slowly warming up to Fabronia despite his orders to kill all Realians, the stubborn Kevin doesn't mind being bossed around by a young Shion, and the Professor, the man who created the giant combinable robot Erda Kaiser, begins working on building a new cosmos based on what Shion has given him. However, as they work, the Black Testament suddenly appears behind them. Shion reflects on her chance to change the past before the great tragedy occurs, but is called out by Alan. They both hurry to the lab where the Black Testament is carrying out Cosmos and ignores the attacks of everyone there. Ziggy calls him out as his real name, Voyager, as Voyager reaches out to strangle Shion. Before he gets too far, the Hilbert effect lights up from within her pod, and Cosmos suddenly reaches out to snatch his wrist. Hurling him away, the rebuilt Cosmos version 4 is much faster and stronger than before. Combining their attacks, Ziggy and Cosmos team up to drive the Black Testament away, but he promises to return later. Later, Shion talks with Jin about their opportunity to take the Vessels of Anima, and not only prevent the Zohar incident of the past, but also leave this world. He points out that level of interference is far too great, but she counters that this pass is not what she wants anyway. She convinces the rest of the party of her plan, but Momo also has some reservations. Together they raid Labyrinthos, and Momo catches a glimpse of Joachim and splits off to talk to him. He recognizes her and admits when he lost his daughter Sakura, he studied the UMN, Zohar, and Udu for the sake of seeing if he could retrieve her consciousness and return her to life. Since the Unus Mundus network is a collective subconscious that has existed since the universe began, he found that there are human consciousnesses within the UMN. However, he has found that Sakura's consciousness has disappeared, and the new one he is growing is not hers, but he is okay with that. He regards this new Realian as his second daughter, and believes she will be the future hope for all Realians. At the same time, Shion spots Kevin alongside Suo, and going to Kevin's office, Momo spots that on the list of test subjects, Shion's name is also there. Shion confronts Jin on if he knew about this, and Jin dodges the question suspiciously. They also spot the prototype combat realians that Yutik used during the Milshin conflict, and Shion identifies them as the realians that actually killed her mother, equally shocked that Kevin actually made them. Continuing on their mission, they make it to the Zohar, where they observe Kevin, Margulis, and Suo together, as they state in order to control the Zohar, they must use the Lemageton and convey human will from the vessels of Anima via the UMN. But since that results in direct contact with Udu, and Udu strikes primal fear in humans, they must use realians that lack that fear. 
Moving on, the group finds the vessels of Anima and proceed to open them, finding all 11 here, though among their cages, only three are capable of being operated as ES craft. However, Xion notes the ESs are made by Vector, meaning that behind the scenes, Vector is covertly overseeing the weapons developed here, too. As they power up their ESs, they are detected, but note their synchronization to the vessels has increased, giving them access to greater power. As they escape, they intercept a message stating they are prepping Aoi Uzuki now, and Xion breaks off to go rescue her mother. Unfortunately, the rest of the group is pushed back by heavy resistance, so they cannot go after her for now. As Xion dashes to her mother's room to save her from her fate, the Red Testament stands in her way, and reveals himself to have been Kevin this entire time. As she is shocked beyond words, the normal guards at this time catch and detain her. As she waits to be interrogated by Utik, she realizes people who have died have come back as testaments, and Margulis calls in Suo and young Kevin to handle her questioning. Xion's hot-headedness causes her to reveal too much, while at the same time, Verbronia says to the group they are going to start torturing her for information. Jin points out the perfect opportunity is about to begin, as the Federation's invasion is about to occur, and Jin, Junior, and Chaos know exactly how things will play out, giving them a window to rescue Xion. As the descent operation begins like they remember it, Suo finds he is being ignored by the whims of Margulis and Kevin, who intend to use dangerous experimental combat reallians in conjunction with an incomplete Song of Nephilim to deal with the Federation. Suo then decides to free Xion, as despite how things seem, he intends to protect his wife, but urges Xion to save his daughter Xion. Jin confronts Pellegree, as it turns out they were former lovers, though after beating her they meet up with Xion who is now softer on her father, now that she saw how he was always concerned about his family until the end. Hurrying towards the church, they run past the ongoing battle of the Milshin conflict as the Song of Nephilim has begun to play. Within the church, Fabronia continues to look after Virgil, who has taken a liking to her, as she reveals she is actually half-human unlike other Reallians. Suddenly, young Xion enters the church, followed closely by combat realities gone mad from the Song of Nephilim, and Fabronia steps between them, urging Virgil and Xion to escape. They quickly slash her down and push away Virgil, as the berserk realities begin to now devour Fabronia. In despair and rage, Virgil cuts down the realities here, takes Fabronia, and hands Xion a key to Labyrintho so she can escape to her family. More realities shuffle inside as Virgil grabs a gun and young Xion runs into the night. At this time, Xion and the group now arrive to see Virgil overwhelmed, and Xion is furious to see Fabronia dead before her again. They help Virgil as Xion shows him the Reallian self-destruct code and he immediately uses it after pushing her away. Xion calls out for him, but suddenly the Blue Testament appears to mock her, as Virgil points out Xion's many hypocrisies, such as wanting to save Reallians while also being willing to force him to self-destruct. After they fight a little, the spirit of Fabronia now comes out to calm Virgil, reminding him of the relationship they once had, and pointing out that he had become a testament just so he could return to this point. She forgives him, and says he did save her, and now wants him to see that Xion will show everyone a future for humans and realians. Breaking down with his heart now lighter, Virgil abandons being a testament as he takes the body of Fabronia, as her spirit now leaves with him too, urging Xion to stay strong as they both pass on to the collective unconscious together. Now chasing after young Xion, they return back to Labyrinthos, while inside, Suo was surprised to find Xion back, pushing her into a room as he spots the combat realians encroaching outside. They impale and kill him quickly, as they now move into Xion's mother's room with Xion hiding inside. Tossing aside her dead father, the realians proceed to stab endlessly into her mother's body in the bed, as Xion now comes in to defeat the realians but sees she is too late. Young Xion is traumatized to see her parents brutally murdered, and in her grief she cries out, contacting the Zohar and bringing the Gnosis here. Xion is shocked to learn she is actually the one who originally called the Gnosis here, and in her panic cries out and shines with light as well, this time calling forth Abel's Ark. Junior objects, saying this didn't happen 15 years ago, and Jin quickly realizes they are not in the past after all. Chaos clarifies they are actually in a reality constructed inside of Xion's mind by temporarily restoring the consciousness of people from the past and using Xion to accomplish now what they couldn't before. Kevin now speaks out, stating that in order to awaken Abel, they needed the resonance of the power between both Xions. It's true, though, that the Gnosis that attacked Milsha was not brought about by Dr. Mizrahi nor Albedo's link to Udu, but instead Xion. He now steps forward, saying he needs her and wants her to come with him. He mentions what Jin has been hiding, and that is that Xion is suffering from the same illness as her mother, in which she can convey her will to Udu, but the stress of direct contact with Udu will cause her to fall into a coma and die. Alan wonders why the subjects are forced to talk with Udu, but Junior points out from personal experience it's impossible to cut contact with Udu, as it exists in a higher plane and chooses it on its own. Kevin then insists he became a testament to gain the power needed to save Xion, as only he and Telos can save her. 
He admits he made Cosmos as a prototype to eventually build Telos, but had to dispose of her because she grew too close to Xion. The source of Cosmos' power comes from Udu, by means of the Zohar, and so every time Cosmos uses her abilities, Xion, who reacts to Udu, loses a bit of her life. Xion begins to be taken in by his words and her buried feelings, but Jin steps in, reminding her Kevin died and this isn't him. He orders Cosmos to step in, as Telos also enters the room, and Kevin orders Cosmos to obey him. However, version 4 Cosmos informs him the Cosmos Kevin created was already destroyed by Telos, so she is not obligated to obey him thanks to her new designers. With that, she knocks Xion out and flees, summoning her cycle and making a beeline straight for the Elsa. Wasting no time, the Elsa picks up the rest of the party as the events of Milsha plays out, and everyone escapes just in time. However, Abel's Ark now appears before them just like how they witnessed, meaning they never really were in the past, and that entire experience was just for Xion to awaken this. However, the Ark quickly emits a wave that erases a nearby planet and shifts away, that was now moving through the UMN network. Since they know Abel's Ark seats Zarathustra, they know it must be heading towards planet Mictum, but observe that while it does so, hundreds of planets disappear as it passes them. Both Dimitri on the Federation side and Margulis with Ormus both notice this movement and head to Mictum as well, fighting as soon as they arrive. As the group gives chase themselves, they track that Abel's Ark has also entered normal space around Mictum, and the Merkaba is also in pursuit. As they figure, Dimitri is using the Merkaba and Omega to obtain the original Zohar within the Ark. With their priority being the Zohar, their new plan is to board the Merkaba and secure Omega and Dimitri first. Launching in the Elsa, they navigate past the chaotic battlefield of Gnosis versus the Federation versus Ormus, all vying for space above Mictum. Going ahead in their ESs, they barrel into the warship Merkaba, mostly unopposed, slipping in past the noise of battle, and head directly for the core area. Within, Junior is informed that Dimitri has not only taken over Gainan, which was one of Gainan's design purposes, but that the role of Citrine and Gainan are to destroy Junior. It is further explained that a large number of designer children were made for the live transfer experiments in the early stages of the UMN, and Dimitri is the lone survivor from those experiments. He came into contact with Udu during the experiment, and while it left him terrified, he also gained a new ability that he eventually put into all URTVs he made, the ability to transfer his mind to others. From this, Negredo was always intended to be Dimitri's future vessel, and he would keep living through new bodies until he found a way to defeat his fear. For this, the Zohar emulators would be used, as each one is a record of the wave pattern data from its corresponding vessel of Anima, and Junior has kept all of them safely on the Durandal. Realizing that the Durandal was Dimitri's real target and this was all just the diversion, the group hurries back to the Durandal. At the same time, Dimitri's troops invade and mercilessly gun down the crew of the Durandal, taking no prisoners, as he seeks the Arbiter codes within Junior's second-in-command and navigator, Marianne Shelley, so that he can unlock the emulators. Kanan attempts to intervene, but Citrine is there to keep him at bay, proving herself more than capable. By the time Junior and the rest arrive, they see his crew wiped out, infuriating him, and they hurry to confront Citrine and Dimitri. Citrine declares her unique power to kill the Red Dragon, Rubido, and so they clash, though Junior is able to overcome and kill one of the last variant URTVs. As Dimitri prepares the emulators, the group rushes in, thinking he intends to use the Zohar and emulators to destroy God, but Dimitri reveals he intends to use them to ascend into Godhood. The Durandals now set out a course straight for Abel's Ark, ramming into it and transforming both the Ark and Omega. As the events are being watched by Wilhelm, who knows Dimitri's endeavor does not impact his own plan, Heinlein gives the order to a reluctant Margulis to pull back the Ormus fleet and leave Abel's Ark and the Zohar alone. By Doctus' suggestion, the group enacts a risky maneuver to short-range jump into the Ark itself in order to maintain pursuit of Dimitri, and find themselves in a very alien environment. Within, they find the Gnosis have bound themselves to the emulators, and are thus forced to destroy each one as they break down the barriers protecting Dimitri. As they get closer, they note a more powerful resonance with their vessels of Anima, and figure they are seeing the effects of Dimitri releasing more of Zohar's power. Confronting him directly, Dimitri declares his intent to take Zarathustra from Mictum and then ascend into the higher plane himself, and uses his new power to merge with Omega to become a bigger threat to the group. As the group edges out a win, the White Testament descends down and quickly reveals himself to be Albedo like they suspected. He quickly removes both Abel and the Zohar from Omega, taking them away, which also separates away Dimitri too. Albedo then speaks directly to Gainan, whose spear comes out to beg Junior to kill him while he's still a little in control. Junior is hesitant, and Albedo urges Gainan to form a link with him, reminding Junior he's the eldest and the leader, and that Dimitri is contaminated by Udu, meaning they have the power to neutralize him. As they form the link, Gainan forces his mind into Albedo's body, and forces Albedo's mind into Junior, creating Rubido's true form. 
In their link, Negredo reveals his role to observe and potentially kill Rubido, something Albedo always knew, but now says goodbye as he will end that duty on his own terms. As he vanishes both himself and Dimitri, Albedo disappears too, but not before revealing he sent the Zohar and Abel to Mictum. Back on the Elsa, the group notices the Ormus fleet moving to surround them, and so hurry past the blockade to Mictum. At the same time, Heinlein scolds Margulis for again refusing to pull back the Ormus fleet, and reveals himself in person, as it turns out to be Wilhelm the Vector. He explains the origin of Ormus, which is a religion he created for the purpose of safeguarding the words and artifacts of God that can end the universe. To Margulis' shock, their goal of returning to Lost Jerusalem was all just a lie, powered only by blind faith and nothing. Back with the group, as they witness the destruction of Mictum, they defeat the vessels of Anima from Ormus, which is quickly collected by the Black Testament, and Ziggy recognizes both he and Voyager from here from back when they were both human. Pellegrino now stands in their way, and despite Jin's pleas for her to step down, she is struck down and killed as her own vessel of Anima is also collected. Beyond, Voyager stands in the place where he once killed Ziggy's wife and child, and points out Ziggy was once considered for being a testament, just like many of them were. He points out they have had an observational unit monitoring them for the past 15 years called Program Kanan, also known as Lactus, an old ally of Ziggy back when he was a human 100 years ago, and one of the early model Reallians. As it turns out, the current ally Kanan is a rebuilt Lactus, and without himself being aware until recently, was built to spy on the rest of them all his time. Now facing off against the Black Testament, they defeat his Black ES and free his vessel of Anima, but Voyager himself is still unharmed. Kanan now steps forward, bringing up that Voyager accepted becoming a testament in order to cheat death, but Kanan's own subconscious domain is linked to the Compass of Order, and offers to link him to it to give him the power of God in return for being made a testament himself. Voyager greedily accepts, and by linking in, he sees the Compass of Order and its power before him. However, his greed proves to be his downfall, as he fails to absorb the power before him, and Kanan grabs hold of him, dragging them both into the phase space. As they disappear, he apologizes for his program role to betray the group, but now wishes to have a reason beyond that for existing, by protecting them all with his sacrifice. As the group moves on through the underground ruins, Nephilim appears to say that Shion must awaken her other half in order to save this universe. She suddenly finds herself in Lost Jerusalem in a tomb, finding a young chaos within. Opening the casket, she sees a woman who looks just like Cosmos and Telos, and as she wakes up, Telos appears to reveal that Cosmos has awakened the will of Mary Magdalene. Telos actually has the body of Mary, while Shion is the maiden of Mary Magdalene, who is the key to her will. The two weapons duel, but with the help of the group, Cosmos is able to prove that she is far stronger than before. As Telos hurls her most powerful attack at Cosmos, Cosmos reveals her own similar weapon, hurling an orb of energy able to break past Telos's and trap her. Then, with a single strike, she defeats Telos and the two begin resonating with each other as Cosmos absorbs her other half to complete her awakening. Looking on, Wilhelm remarks that Mary Magdalene will now lead all consciousness to Zarathustra, as the Gnosis phenomenon expands in its reach, consuming more systems, as many more Gnosis are now gathering at Mictum. Kevin waits for Shion ahead, and reveals that when he was a child, Wilhelm approached him and told him that the universe is fated to die, but his plan was to stop history at a certain point and restart it, looping it endlessly. A young Kevin would agree to this, still bitter at the loss of his mother, and years later he would join the Zohar research team, and eventually create a vessel for Mary called Cosmos. The day he died was also necessary, as he needed to cast aside his physical body in order to obtain more power, and his absence would deepen Xion's bond to Cosmos. Regardless, Xion is persuaded that Kevin is the only person who cares about her personally, and so opts to go to him. Jin and Junior refuse to allow Xion to go over to his side, with or without her consent, and the two sides clash, though Alan jumps between them to stop the fighting. He stands up for humanity, and points out the Testaments are not the only ones who can save the universe, especially since each of them have used their power to run away from their obstacles and fears. Kevin easily knocks him aside and mocks him, but Alan continues that unlike Kevin, he understands Xion's quiet suffering and pain. Wanting to share that burden for the rest of his life is why he would never abandon her, and in response, Kevin aims to kill Alan. Cosmos saves Alan, saying she feels his pain as well as Xion's, and confronts Xion on what will truly make her happy. Seeing all of this, Xion says to Kevin that even though she loves him despite being used, would likely be happy with him, but unless she was able to share it with others, there would be no point to only her happiness. So, she chooses to stay with the group, though Kevin takes the rejection harshly, opting to kill the group instead, but finds himself unable to overwhelm them in combat. Seeing this, Wilhelm calls back a frustrated Kevin, and the group follows him into the next room. Beyond, they are surprised to find Abel there hanging in suspension while Wilhelm quickly summons all of their awakened ESs and claims the vessels of Anima back from them. 
Wilhelm reveals he has been many roles so far, such as Vector CEO, Head of Hyams, Patriarch of Ormus, and Federation Executive Committee Director, but none of those truly define him. The device behind him is Zarathustra, the world-resetting device, as he now waits for Xion to activate it with her key. He reveals the souls gathered here already are the Gnosis, which are the forms of people who have rejected the world. Not wasting any time and not caring about Xion's voice in the matter, Wilhelm tortures Xion in an attempt to get her to have the desire to use her key, but she still resists. He orders Mary to retrieve the key, and while she does so, she then smashes it in front of him, which even he did not expect. Revealing herself to be Cosmos instead, Kevin takes advantage of the distraction to thrust his arm through Wilhelm's back, trapping him and saving Xion. This hardly phases Wilhelm though, as Zarathustra now goes out of control, and he warms this much energy will end the universe. Refusing to accept that outcome, Kevin draws power from Zarathustra into himself, intending to die alongside Wilhelm. As Zarathustra is suppressed, he urges the group to destroy it, and working together, the group manages to destroy the world-resetting device. As Wilhelm disappears now, Chaos, who was revealed to be Yeshua, says he'll have faith in the light of humanity's will, and as Kevin disappears, Xion thanks him for helping her get this far, and will always treasure their love. To their surprise, Zarathustra lumbers to life again, and Abel leaves it alongside Nephilim, who explains all of the will and Gnosis gathered here have nowhere to go, and so together they will gather all the wills into her. After that, she will dimensionally shift this entire region of space to Lost Jerusalem, which is a planet once called Earth. The universe will still continue to dissipate and be destroyed, but their light of their will carries unlimited potential. Chaos now reveals that ever since he started to exist, his power of anima has put the universe on the path of destruction. To save both Yeshua and the universe, Mary separated the power of anima into the vessels and sealed them, which cost her her life. After being sealed, Chaos simply became a spectator, not knowing what anima was or what it was for, but now he knows. He then states that himself and Mary will stay behind as the rest of them escape, for when they are gone, the speed of the universe's destruction will slow down and buy everyone another few ten thousand years. He reminds Xion the key to saving everyone lies in lost Jerusalem, as himself and the wills of everyone turned into Gnosis will return there. Xion and Cosmos exchange a heartfelt goodbye of their own, and soon the group lifts off on Junior's ES. As the group leaves, Mary releases the seal on Yeshua, and gathers the vessels back into one. With this power, they all now begin to call the Gnosis to them, but as the party observes, many of the Gnosis are strangely refusing to join as one, and Cosmos moves to buy Nephilim and Chaos time to complete the shift. After setting down the group, Jin moves back with his ES, knowing Cosmos will need backup with that many Gnosis. As Xion is forced to say goodbye to her brother, she apologizes for how she acted to him all these years, but he forgives her, and wants her to be happy as he flies back. At the same time, all the UMN columns are disappearing from all regions of space, and the Gnosis swarming the group don't make their escape any easier. Alan steps up to prove he intends to protect Xion with his life, which she finally takes notice of. Cosmos and Jin are pushed to their limit to buy time and destroy Gnosis, and Jin is eventually forced to abandon his ES and slay foes on foot. Mortally wounded as the fight goes on, he still fights to his last breath, though exchanging blows with one leaves him impaled on the enemy's sword, and staggering back it's too much for him to handle. As he dies, he welcomes the peace and falls with a smile on his face. Now with one last major foe before them, a broken Cosmos throws herself at it with her phase transfer cannon, determined to protect Xion till the bitter end, colliding and destroying both herself and the final Gnosis threat. Preparations complete, Nephilim, Chaos, and Abel waste no time in warping the space around them, though Chaos lets one last column linger as an escape route for the Elsa as it launches its overboost to jet out just in time. As the game ends, the group luckily warps close to the Damarong and is rescued. As time passes, Xion is determined to find Lost Jerusalem, though with the UMN network gone, only normal flight is possible. Momo wants to join her, but Xion reminds her that her job now is to help Skientia construct a brand new network for travel and communication. Junior will be joining Xion for this trip, and trusts Ziggy to take care of Yuli and Momo for him in the meanwhile. Alan and the crew of the Elsa join Xion as well, as they venture out to fulfill their promise to Chaos. Thinking to herself, Xion thinks Wilhelm wasn't completely wrong in his mission, even though she disagreed with his methods. To herself, she feels that to be human is to be flawed, but it's also to take steps forward to a future overflowing with hope. Elsewhere, drifting on her own, is the remains of Cosmos, as Chaos speaks to her and urges both of them to sleep until the universe needs them again, as there is still work for them to do. Cosmos complies, as her body drifts to an unknown fate toward lost Jerusalem, with the sun now rising on a new day. Xenosaga Episode 3 has enjoyed the success of selling over 370,000 copies worldwide.